It's really good to see everyone. It's good to have our visitors with us today. The lesson this morning is going to be based upon a request that was made of Philip by certain Greeks in John 12, verse 21. The request was, Sir, we would see Jesus. If there was ever a time when men need to see Jesus, it is now. I want to begin by looking at some groups of people who desperately need to see Jesus. And one of those groups is our youth. Young people are exhorted to love life and to remember their God all at the same time. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 9 through chapter 12 verse 2, Solomon is going to exhort the youth. And listen to what he tells them. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remember or remove sorrow from thy heart, and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh. When thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. Solomon knew more about men than any man that ever lived. And therefore, he was qualified to exhort our youth to godly living. And the reason is because he spoke from great experience. He had experienced a lot in life and found out what was vanity and what was not. He was also was experienced with wisdom because God granted him great wisdom. But more than anything else, he was speaking by inspiration. Though he failed miserably to live up to his knowledge in his own life, he became God's instrument to teach us truth in many areas. You know, the road to happiness is found in practicing all of these great truths and following the wonderful wisdom that God has given to those who were his inspired writers. You know, after a lifetime of searching for the meaning of life, I want you to hear well the, the concluding words of Solomon here in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. And he says, For God for bring, shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Solomon is saying payday is coming. So live right, be prepared, and get ready. But more times than not, our youth seem to look for happiness in every place except in Jesus the Christ. They idolize sports and sports personalities. And oftentimes our young people get caught up in these dangerous drugs trying to enhance their physical strength so they can excel on the field. They see their idols, the people they look up to, their, the athletes they look up to, they see them doing this and so they go and do the same thing. And they put family and Christ and the church in second, third, sometimes last places so that they could just play the game. And woe to the preacher, the elder, the concerned church member that may raise their voice against such. You know, young people need to see Jesus, even on the athletic field. But another place that young people seem to try to search for happiness is in drugs. You know, they may toy around with a little marijuana, they get hooked on it, but then it quits the satisfaction and they move on to harsher, harder drugs. Every one of them eventually loses their freedom and many of them actually lose their lives because of the addiction. Many are pushed to crime and violence trying to pay for their habits. We have to remember that Jesus Christ is the answer to the drug problem here. Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, taught about self-denial. We sometimes need to deny ourselves of these cravings. And this is what he said in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 14. He says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. 
But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Christ, not drugs, is the answer. Do you know young people also sometimes search for happiness in things like alcohol? They pop a few caps on a beer, and before long they realize that they are addicted to alcohol. Alcohol is a, uh, a miserable master to have to serve. It's a depressant. It'll give you a short, temporary high, but then it drops you like a lead balloon. It's a slave master, and it destroys our sense of reason. And whether people agree with it or not, God hates social drinking because he knows what it's going to lead to. It'll lead to more. And so does every right-thinking person. Jesus Christ is the answer for alcohol. In fact, I want you to listen to Paul's words that he gave to us in the book of Galatians. I want to begin in Galatians 2, verse 20. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Just a little bit later in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, it says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. In chapter 6, verse 14, he says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. With Christ truly in our life and on our side, alcohol would never be a problem. Young people also search for happiness sometimes in sex. They prostitute their minds and their bodies for self-gratification outside of the marriage bed. And they do this all against the admonitions of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 28, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her in his heart already. James, who was the brother of our Lord, <clears throat> said in James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, <clears throat> bringeth forth death. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hebrews 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But adulter adulterers and whoremongers, God will judge. The only place that God allows sexual activity to happen is in the marriage bed. Anything else is considered as sin, and it will cost you your soul. Young people, remember, God is always watching you. Remember the all-seeing eye. You can't hide from him. You can't go behind closed doors or hide in the dark. God always knows what's going on. Jesus' purity in words are the answer to the use sexual promiscuity. In fact, what he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do you know young people also search for happiness and achievements and academics rather than in Christ himself? Paul gave a warning about this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The parents sometimes encourage this. <clears throat> In many instances, they become responsible for their children's situation because they push them into this. They push their kids to excel in academia to the exclusion of gospel meetings, Sometimes even Wednesday night services. Sometimes they discourage them from going to church camp to do something else. Or even sometimes even being honest in what they do. You know, I talked about Wednesday night. Wednesday night always seems to be the service that a lot of people think, well, it's okay if you miss every now and then. It's okay because this game is very important and that team is relying upon my kids. So, you know, one time won't hurt. Then it turns out another time. Before long, they're never in Wednesday night services. And then it goes from there. <clears throat> then it's the Sunday night services. We don't ever see them, very seldom. And then it goes on to the Sunday morning. Before long, you don't see them at all, period. 
They have completely apostatized. And if you see yourself in that type of situation on that road, you're on a very dangerous road. And you need to look at your situation very seriously and your commitment to Christ. You know, worldly knowledge can be good, but it cannot be placed above spiritual education and encouragement. The wisdom of this world, we're told, is foolishness with God. But one who is wise in the heavenly wisdom is not a, just a blessing to the world, he's also a blessing to themselves. Christ is the answer, and our young people should desire to see Jesus. Because without him, life has absolutely no meaning whatsoever. Do you know there's another group that certainly needs to see Jesus? And that's our parents. Parents too often are so busy that they cease to be parents. One of our main duties as parents is to raise our children in the Lord. Listen to Paul's admonition to the fathers in Ephesians 6 verse 4. It says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Far too often, our fathers, sometimes parents, love their work more than they love their children. Their job has become number one priority. So the church and the spirituality and the quality time necessary to raise their children or to have a relationship with their spouse suffers tremendously. They expect these relationships to flourish with just maybe three minutes a day. That's not going to happen. These things like this, they require time. Time and more time. Jesus demands parents to recognize their priorities in their work, their recreation, and also in their responsibilities and relationships. And there's no shortcuts to any of this. Anything, for anything to grow it, that's worthwhile, it's going to take time to take care of it. And Jesus is worth all of our time that we can give him. But sadly, parents are often addicted to materialism, to drugs, to alcohol, to pride or providing for old age security. But again, Jesus Christ is the answer to all of these dilemmas. In fact, I want you to listen to his words to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. But I want to kind of go back to verse 34 and set the stage. It says, but when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And notice Jesus' answer to him. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. In other words, with your whole being. This demands sacrifice to God, and nothing less is going to be acceptable. But by this, you can become better parents. And by this, you can also raise better families. Another group who needs to see Christ, that's elders. Elders are shepherds, the shepherds of the flock. And they are to be like the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to Peter's words to the elders in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. He says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And he says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a, receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. This passage of scripture, no doubt, tells us that elders have authority, but they also have responsibility. Effective godly leadership is certainly needed in the church today. And it's a sad day in Zion when elders seem to think that the building or money or numbers is the most important thing. More important than those who are lost or more important than the spirituality of the congregation that they oversee. All of us can recognize the need of a 
building with all of its comforts. But if it becomes a matter over truth or spirituality, over mission work, over the discipline of the ungodly, then their priorities are not in the right place. Their main responsibility, of course, is in the spiritual leadership to make sure that we are headed in the right direction, not so much the physical. Yes, they do have authority over some physical things, but the spiritual is far more important because it is eternal rather than temporal. Now, elders are required by God to take heed unto themselves and also to the flock, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, because if they don't, then both are going to be lost. So who should set the tone for mission emphasis in a congregation or about the spirituality of the congregation or the tone for personal evangelism? And if it's not the church's shepherds, then who would it be? Doesn't God's word teach that elders are responsible? They're also going to give an account of themselves to God on how they oversee their congregation, Hebrews 13, 17. If the chief shepherd came to seek and save that which is lost, shouldn't the local shepherds do the same thing? What are elders going to say in the judgment about encouraging the disciples' commitment <clears throat> or their sacrifice and their service or maybe reaching out to the lost or in caring for the poor and the orphans and the widows? Elders are stewards, Titus chapter 1, verse 7. And that which God has entrusted to them is precious beyond measure. I'm talking about people's souls. But elders, like any member of God's church, must constantly check their priorities, make sure that they are also walking in the light and being pleasing to God. Many elders, they just love office work. They love filing through tons of paperwork. But when it comes to personal Bible studies, they're never taught. When it comes to mission work, it's never done. When it comes to discipline, it never seems to get off the table. The important things seem to get lost in all the baggage. Many elders, they also ignore the rebellion that's going on within the congregation. The congregation may become more and more worldly and sadly, many elders, they just turn the other way. Families separate. They divorce unscripturally. And the elders just look the other way because they don't want to make any waves. And they allow sin to fester in the congregation. Immodesty among the congregation seems to increase as the weather gets warmer. And sometimes people get involved in unethical events and the elders seem to ignore it. The sheep go astray, and the shepherds sleep. But godly elders must desire to see Jesus so they can know how to lead and to guard the flock properly. Jesus has all the answers. They need to see Jesus like all of us do. But one other group I want to talk about that really need to see Jesus, and that's the preachers. Preachers sometimes are far too concerned with the size of the congregation, the size of their paycheck, or how much the people actually like them. Too often, we look at the physical things rather than the spiritual. And that's a sad day in Zion when that happens. We need to be concerned about standing for the truth. We need to be concerned about the purity of the congregation and the progress of the congregation's spiritual growth. That's why we are teachers, we're preachers, to help people to grow in the faith. But too often the numbers game becomes the biggest game in town. They ignore the signs of the, or the sins of the brethren, they refuse to, to preach the hard sermons because they don't want to offend anybody and run anybody off. They want to have this great church in the community, bigger and better than anybody else. I mean, that'd be a, a nice thing to have if you did it in the right way. But such great churches like that, if they are not after looking toward truth and trying to do the truth, they're nothing but stench in the nostrils of God. These preachers are only hirelings. They're time servers. 
They may be great administrators, business administrators, may be good social workers, they may be good counselors, but as far as defenders of the faith and gospel preachers, they are simply pathetic. We are to stand for the truth. These men are despised of God. Preachers are to be men of God, standing for the truth, debtors to all, but indebted to none. They're to be God-fearing men, but we are not to be fearing men. In fact, Jesus talked about that in Matthew 10, 28. Fear not them which are able to kill the body, but not able to kill the soul. We're to seek Jesus Christ in our hearts, in our lives, and also in our work. Any other kind of man who would attempt to be any other type of preacher would be nothing more than a hypocrite and do more damage to the church than anything else. So who should desire to see Jesus? The answer is each and every one of us. And I hope that desire is there. We all need to renew our commitment to our Bibles, to self-discipline, to sacrifice, to evangelism, to standing for the truth and nothing but the truth. We should never compromise the truth. We must show that the world, show the world that Jesus Christ truly lives and that he truly lives in us. We must desire to see Jesus. So how great is your desire to see Jesus in your life? You know, only you can fulfill that desire. We can help you along with it. We can encourage you, but that desire has to be yours. And if you have that desire to see Jesus, and yet you've not been living like you should. Maybe you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, never been baptized for the remission of your sins, meaning you're still in your sins, and you're not heaven bound. The water's ready, and we can help you if you're ready. If you're not, we would be glad to sit down with you and study some more, open up the scripture, see what God has to say. Not what I have to say, but what God says. And if you are a child of God and yet you're not dedicated like you should be, you can rededicate your life this morning. If you have a need, let us help you. Won't you come while together we stand and sing?